to the screencast where I'll be addressing uh, mechanisms that eukaryotes use in regulating the expression of their genes. So by the end of this, uh, you should be able to hear, this is actually a review uh, to be able to describe and explain heterochromatin versus euchromatin. Uh, and this is the regulation at the uh, transcription level. So this is sort of a review. But then uh, B here, regulatory sequences and regulatory elements, these two things uh, are going to go together. So being able to explain and describe what these are and how these play regulatory roles. Um, a little bit about what regulatory genes are and how they are different from uh, structural genes and the genes that are coding for uh, polypeptides. And then, uh, again, down here, explaining, describing how the regulatory sequences interact with the regulatory elements. That comes back up to uh, these two, uh, B and C right here. Then uh, post-transcriptionally and, and then also translationally looking at some other points for uh, regulation, we'll talk specifically here about uh, newer stuff here, siRNA or uh, silencing RNAs and, and microRNAs, as well as then proteasomes. Uh, this link right here is actually a pretty good uh, uh, animation and, and big picture view of what we're talking about here, so I encourage you to take a look at that. Right? So let's get started. When we're talking about regulation of gene expression uh, in a eukaryote, I'm looking at this left-handed diagram over here. Uh, there are multiple points for that regulation to occur. And just so that we're clear, when I'm talking regulation, we mean uh, regulation of gene expression, meaning that we could either start gene expression, we could stop gene expression, or we could modulate gene expression. That is, uh, it's on, but it's not full on, so this would be uh, uh, akin to or analogous to like changing the volume on uh, speakers, right? So you have the uh, the radio on, uh, but you can then adjust the volume. So how loud is it? So in this case, it would be like how much protein is made, uh, what kinds of protein right, are made, and then also uh, leading to that, that second thought there um, about variation, what kinds of proteins uh, could be made from the expression of those genes. So this regulation is not just on or off. I mean, it definitely is on or off, start or stop, but it's also considering here this modulation and then um, variation of the expression <coughs> of the expression products, meaning polypeptides or the RNAs. Okay, so if we look at over here, um, again, the majority of eukaryotic uh, regulation is going to take place at this transcription level, which we've already addressed in a previous screencast and in class a little bit there. So I'll review that quickly and then get into uh, sort of, so this will be the first part of this. The second part is going to be talking here about the uh, transcription regulation a little bit more detail. And then out here, uh, post-transcriptionally -transcri post and translationally dealing with uh, these sort of modifications down here. So sort of breaking this into four, four parts. Right? Um, so if we look on the, on the right diagram here, much of the regulation of eukaryotic expression occurs at the transcription level. Right? And this involves uh, DNA unpacking involving the D DNA demethylation and histone acetylation. So this is a review. Uh, we looked at this already where if we are unpacking the chromatin moving this way, uh, we are uh, uh, acetylating, we, and this is the acetyl group here, so this is the acetyl group, and then here's the methyl group, right? Uh, X being what it's bound onto. So we acetylate histones, and uh, we demethylate the DNA to unpack that from the nucleosome or from the, this, uh, this uh, uh, heterochromatin form to then the uh, euchromatin form. If we're going to go this way on that diagram, then we are going to uh, deacetylate the histones and we're going to methylate DNA, right? So then uh, on the right over here, we see electron micrographs. And so all of this would be euchromatin here. You can see the little strings that have been, uh, this is of the DNA that is available to have transcription factors bind to, have RNA polymerase bind to, et cetera. Whereas down here, it's more heterochromatin uh, in form, and it's more tightly packed up, wound up there around the histone proteins and unavailable for transcription factors, RNA polymerase to bind to. So this is uh, regulatory, right? This is the way that eukaryotes will either start or stop the expression of those genes. 
Here's just another diagram uh, showing you that. Uh, don't worry about all these sort of initials in here. Uh, but over here, it's showing you what's happening to the DNA and what's happening to the histones, right? And then the DNA and the histones here, right? So would this one down here be uh, euchromatin or heterochromatin? Or would this be heterochromatin or euchromatin up here? Right? And which one would be available for, for uh, gene expression? Okay. Uh, <coughs> Moving on here, we had also talked in class in previous screencasts here about these regulatory sequences, right? Now, these regulatory sequences, let's say that we get this DNA unpacked, right, unwound from the, from the histones, and now it's available for uh, transcription. Well, not quite just yet because we have these regulatory sequences that are not uh, going to be actually transcribed, right? These are not expressed. Another way of saying not transcribed is that they are not expressed. Uh, and these are sometimes also referred to then as regulatory genes. Regulatory genes. Um, and there's, there's a, a subcategory of these regulatory genes, which we can address a little bit later on. But these uh, regulatory sequences, again, are not transcribed, not expressed here. Uh, but we talked about promoter sequences as one of those sequences. And this is where the transcription factors are going to bind. Uh, and when those transcription factors bind, that then allows RNA polymerase 2 to bind. And you begin transcription. So without those promoters or with altered promoters, you're going to get differential uh, uh, transcription factor binding. So altered promoters get you differential. differential uh, transcription factor binding. And by differential, I mean that is different. Like you, you might, by altering this promoter sequence here, you get transcription factors binding more readily, less readily. That's differential, right? So uh, other sequences, right? There are other regulatory sequences. And this is just, again, very general. And this becomes very specific in a hurry. but. Uh, other regulatory sequences, in addition to promoters, uh, would be silencers, right? So these silencers are sequences, and these silencers are areas where repressors are going to bind. So these repressors are elements, re, uh, regulatory elements, uh, read proteins, right? And these proteins are the result, what's wrong here, result of uh, regulatory gene expression. So this is similar to what was happening in operons. Not exactly the same thing that's happening in operons, but it's very similar in that you have these regulatory genes that when they are expressed produce these proteins that will bind to these silencer regions. Right? And when this happens, you do not get any transcription. Right? So if you have re active repressor proteins binding to silencer sequences in eukaryotes, you do not get uh, gene expression, or you get differential gene expression. Right? This is a way of shutting down transcription. Uh, so this is sort of a stopping mechanism here, start, stop. Right? Uh, another se other sequences, other regulatory sequences are enhancers, and so these, se these are sequences on the DNA that where activators are going to bind, and again, these activators are elements, or sometimes referred to as regulatory elements. These are regulatory proteins, right? and these regulatory proteins are the result of regulatory genes being, ex being expressed. So regulatory genes code for these proteins, these elements right, that activate and bind here. So the rest of this diagram here shows you activators binding to enhancers. And that DNA actually folds over on itself here. And this co combination of activators to the enhancers gets transcription factors binding even more readily. So this is a way that uh, we can modulate the transcription, right? Will transcription happen without these enhancers and these activators? The answer is most definitely yes, probably, uh, but happens better, right? Uh, increases the affinity for transcription factors binding to the promoter, binding to this Tata box region here, right? So before we move on, uh, you've got three types of regulatory sequences, right? 
Uh, so you can identify here the, the three types of sequences. And then what are the uh, elements that bind to those? What do we call those elements that bind to those three regulatory sequences? Okay. So you should be able to take a minute and pause this and get that information down. Also, uh, clicking on this animation here uh, in the PowerPoint will also uh, review some of that stuff for you as well. Moving on. This is important, and here's an, a specific example of where this might be important. Different regulatory sequences cause differential gene expression in different cells, leading to different phenotypes. So what we have here is just an example where having these, se these uh, sequences, these promoters, these enhancer sequences, right, the activators, right, the silencers, <coughs> the uh, repressor proteins here might play, might play a role here. So if we have uh, a liver cell here, and we have then a cell that's in the lens of the eye, both of these cells have the exact same genomes in them because of uh, replication. But will the liver cells be expressing the genes of the lens cell and vice versa? The answer is no. And the, qu and, and the answer to why that happens is because of the control elements that are present in those different cells. So if uh, this right here is the uh, gene for albumin, and here's the gene for albumin that's also in the lens cell. It's in the liver cell. In the liver cell, this albumin gene is going to be expressed because it has, if you come back up here, it has the, uh, this, this uh, enhancer sequence specific to it. And when it has that enhancer sequence, that gets different uh, uh, activator proteins binding that are present in that, in that liver cell. And this gene then is turned on in a liver cell. Well, in the, in the lens cell over here, you see that that specific uh, uh, sequence is, is not present. And you don't have those activator proteins. Those are different activator proteins that are there. Uh, and so this gene in the lens cell is turned off because you don't have the proper uh, activator things, things, proteins or elements in that, in that cell. And then vice versa has also happened for this crystalline gene. So here's the crystalline gene right, in the lens cell and in the liver cell. Notice that in the liver cell, the liver cell does not have those regulatory, uh, regulatory genes. And so the activators are not present in the liver cell, but they are present in the lens cell. Consequently, the lens cell is expressing the crystalline genes and making that protein. Okay. So just an example of how those can be regulatory and then also get variation in the phenotypes. Those different cells produce different proteins because of the regulatory sequences and those control elements that are there or not there. Post-transcriptionally, uh, we addressed this earlier a little bit about how the um, splicing of the mRNA can, can be varied. So if you look, uh, we're looking sort of right here at this primary transcript and getting these introns out. And this is a way that we can uh, actually vary which gene product is there. So this slide is showing you uh, about alternative RNA splicing. And so this is generating some variation with this regulation. So we're going to assume that this is on, that we're expressing uh, the DNA right here. And then we get this RNA transcript. And here's the mRNA primary transcript. But then uh, we can get alternative RNA splicing, right, where these are all the exons. Right? So these all get, uh, get expressed, right? And so we're going to remove the introns here. So this would be an intron that gets removed. This would be an intron that gets removed, intron removed, intron removed. But then uh, if we're going to make uh, gene form or, or uh, variant 1, we would take this, and this would be an exon over here. And this over here would be another intron. If we went this way, the orange one would be the intron. Alternatively, the cell could make the orange one an exon and make the green one an intron. And by this way, we can get two different, uh, similar but different proteins. And again, this alternative RNA splicing is a way to generate some variation in uh, the polypeptide that is created.
right? And we'll see some specific examples of that a little bit later. But again, this is just a way that eukaryotic cells can vary, uh, vary the expression product of the genes. Let's move and talk here about uh, post-translational modifications. Right? So now we are at the bottom of this diagram. So let's say that we've got this mRNA out of the cytoplasm here, sorry, out into the cytoplasm. And uh, if that mRNA makes it out into the cytoplasm, it might be translated or it might be degraded. In this case, we're getting, we're, this is effectively stopping gene expression by degrading the, the translation product. If we make it all the way to this polypeptide form, uh, we know that in the ER and in the Golgi, right, there are modifications that happen to that in order to get that active protein. And even if we get that active protein, those active proteins might actually then be degraded before they are uh, used or, or before they're used very long in the cell or exported from the cell. So let's talk about something that's relatively new. I would highly encourage you to actually watch these animations. Uh, they're actually pretty good, especially this nature one here and then the SI and the MI RNA ones. But essentially what's going on here is that this is recently discovered that we talked about RNA molecules folding and becoming functional molecules. And it turns out that the cell, the eukaryotic cells make extensive use of some of these RNA molecules to regulate the expression of the genes. So what's happening here is we have uh, an RNA molecule here that's folded, right? So this would be the five prime end and here's the three prime end. And this thing folds into this conformation, right? But then several of these folds are then uh, cleaved out right, by a nuclease. And that's what you see over here. So this gets cleaved out. And this is now a double-stranded RNA molecule. This enzyme right here is known as dicer. And it's going to dice up this uh, little segment here. And it actually uh, makes it go from a double-stranded RNA to a single-stranded RNA molecule. That single-stranded RNA molecule then uh, combines with an argonaut protein. This is an argonaut protein, and this now is an SI RNA, a silencing RNA. So the, this argonaut protein with this sRNA can then combine here with the mRNA, and that binding uh, triggers this argonaut protein uh, to actually then cleave and uh, attract nucleases to cut up that mRNA molecule, essentially degrading the mRNA, and this then stops essentially gene expression. Another function uh, might be that these uh, microRNAs, the microRNAs over here, so this would be an mI RNA molecule over here, binds at only a few points here, but then remains bound with this argonaut protein to then block the ribosome from translating any of that mRNA, so essentially shutting off gene expression that way. Right? So again, these are all relatively new discoveries. Watch these animations there for a little bit more information on that and uh, a way to, to regulate the expression of the gene post-translationally, or sorry, post-transcriptionally. Let's say that we actually do then make the protein, so post-translationally, uh, these proteins, they don't stay around all the time, uh, and so we want to degrade these proteins. The cell will bind these ubiquitin proteins to them, and so these are molecular tags, and so this ubiquitin onto this protein here uh, signals it to go to a proteasome. This proteasome is this large complex here, and what happens at a proteasome is that the proteasome and the ubiquitin uh, will, will that, that protein entering the proteasome will trigger uh, peptide bond cleavage, peptide bond hydrolysis, right? and you then end up getting these degraded polypeptides, degraded, uh, and these will then be recycled. Right? So these are essentially all, all the way back to the amino acid sequence there of the amino acids, and then they can be recycled back into the cell, okay? So this post-translationally uh, using proteasomes to degrade that. Not to mention the endomembrane system, the Golgi and the, and the uh, ER uh, properly folding those, those proteins is also another way to, to regulate them, the expression there. So that's a lot of information. And uh, again, the, the big heavy hitters here, being able to describe 
uh, and explain what's going on here with the uh, regulatory sequences. Uh, we reviewed here the heterochromatin and the euchromatin bit. And then down here, this interesting bit here about the siRNAs, the miRNAs, and the, and the proteasomes. Okay. Thanks a lot for listening. Bring your questions to class or shoot me an email. All right.